right. Welcome to the Codex Cantina, where I am Una. And I am Crypto. And today we have some awesome guests with us. I'm Cameron Lalana. I am Matt Garrisimovich. Uh, and we're from the Tipsy Tolstoy podcast. It's weird to do that in the other order. Usually we do, yeah, yeah Tipsy Tolstoy podcast first, but you know we're changing things up we're on youtube right right well thank we, you for having us no we're we're so excited to have you guys we've we've watched you know tons of your videos because you guys put your podcast about <laughs> both on podcast but also on youtube for you know the people out there that youtube that want to check you out you guys are available on all those platforms so definitely go over to tipsy tolstoy we'll put a link in the description box down below what are we doing today it is the page 112 tag invented by our friend sean the book maniac what it is is Sometimes authors spend a lot of time crafting the intro, making these incredible plot points, but how's the writing, right? Do we get do we get caught up in things and kind of not pay attention to the writing and such? So this is a tag dedicated to opening up a book just to page 112. You don't know what's going on. You don't know the characters. You missed the <laughs> intro. You look at page 112 for the sole purpose of what's this writing saying and is this interesting? Is this something that I could potentially get into is what we're going today. So what we're going to do is each of us are going to go around and read a 112 selection. And then the other, the other three won't know what that book is. Hopefully, maybe. If they've read it, but they will. <laughs> and then we'll kind of discuss it. And then at the end, we'll reveal what the books are and just kind of talk about, you know, did we have any interest in that sort of thing. Sound good, guys? Sounds, Sounds awesome. good. Are you doing accents? Oh, heck no. <laughs> He loves doing accents. <laughs> okay. All right, guys. Peasants cannot think for themselves. Even if they talk the thing over, they will come to no conclusion. But if you say a single word, what are you trying to say? Asked the priest. Apostasize, apostasize, the old man laughed and waved his fan as he spoke. And supposing I refuse, the priest replied quietly, laughing all the time. Then you'll kill me, I suppose. No, no, said the old man. We won't do that. If we did that, the peasants would become even more stubborn. We made that mistake in Omura and Nagasaki. The Christians there are a stubborn crowd. The old man heaved a deep sigh as he spoke, but it was immediately clear to the priest that the whole thing was a comedy. He even began to feel a secret joy in teasing this old fellow who looked like a monkey. Now, if you are really a father at heart, you ought to feel pity for the Christians, isn't that so? Unconsciously, the priest felt his mouth drop. What a simpleton this old fellow was. Did he think to win something with this childish logic? What he had forgotten, however, was that if this official was as simple as a child, he was equally simple in flaring up in anger when defeated in argument. What about it, said the old man. Punish me alone, said the priest, shrugging his shoulders and laughing. All right, what did you guys think of that? Interesting. I, I thought that was information like, there. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was like Dostoevsky or something at first, just from context, the way they're interacting with each other. <laughs> yeah, trying one religion trying to take over another is what it sounds like, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> For half a second before the references to... to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, I was like, is this like the Grand Inquisitor? If I, I haven't read it in a long time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so it sounds like you kind of picked up on some specific cultural references there too, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I can't really, really tell. It could have been, I don't know. I didn't understand if the references to Hiroshima and Nagasaki were references to the atomic bombings of the cities or uh, to like, to your, to your point about, um, religious you know missionaries if that was just missionaries going to those areas so i was kind of debating between the two to try to set the time period cool yeah i know i know your love of japanese culture and history <laughs> and authors so the whole time i'm thinking kutagawa kutagawa <laughs> what is he doing here yeah. is he trying to write about the invasion of the u.s mm. with the peasants and the father they're trying to convert them to christianity Obviously, with some key words there, monkey, mm. simpleton, very degrading words mm. towards an individual, um, pitying Christians, the word comedy. Mm. I know how you like to try to pick up on those, the, <laughs> the funny in the books. And the word of peasant over and over. Mm. That's a tough one. Hmm. I don't know which way it's coming from. 
if it's coming from a Japanese author or if it's coming from, you know, a Christian priest hmm. author writing about Japan. That's tough. Tough without the context. <laughs> and no names, right? Father and the old man. That's mm -hmm. all we get. Mm. Mm -hmm. Another very Tolstoy technique, at least in his, his later years. <laughs> so dang vague. Well, Tolstoy yeah, would have uh, written it to be more uh, along the lines of uh, the, the, the peasants being the hero, right? Here we're talking yeah. about we don't know if the peasants are the hero. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it made me kind of the the priest and the what I interpreted as potentially like colonial overtones really it kind of brought me brought me back to uh, Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart. That's where I initially was like, oh, maybe this is that, and then I got to the. Uh, Japanese cities, and I was like, no, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that wasn't mentioned. It's been a while, but I don't think it was mentioned there. What about uh, been, uh, what's his name? Y Yukio Mishima? Uh, yeah, 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 because I know Una loves him too, because that could have been post World mm. War II ish, right? You know, in the imperialism of rebuilding Japan by the United States, that would make sense given that over the course of the, of the passage, you kind of have the priest almost deflating going from, even though it, it almost described as like his act as a com, uh, comedic by the end, you know, he's deflated monkey. Like mm. it's really trying to turn around the, the perspective, not that that is, or the portrayal of the priest really. So I could definitely yeah. see your point about Mishima kind of trying to uh, bring us around on, on something. How close are we? <laughs> oh, you, we'll reveal it. We'll reveal it at the end. We'll do, okay. we'll, we'll do all the readings yeah. at the end. All right, so Matt, why don't you do your selection now? I'm taking notes. I'm cheating the whole way. You know me, I cheat. <laughs> yes, you do. That's fine. That's how you and win. I typed mine out because it is lightly edited because I had to take out the name of the book. <laughs> <laughs> the um, name of the book? Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> is it the name of the book? That's hilarious. I, I also oh, had to do that for yeah. some... I don't know why both of us chose books where they said the title of it on that page, but... I shall read <clears throat> from my type dot selection. Me, 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 me. <laughs> <laughs> we began to free ourselves from the ropes. The warrior Ep tore off his ropes and untied us. Ep to the unconscious general. I made an immediate decision. The machine gun, equipped with a new cartridge, had shown all oily and new near the fallen admiral. The very same kind lay in the trunk of the porter, Samson, who had sheltered me as an adolescent at the Cross Knife Station in the winter of 1920. I grabbed it, released the safety lock, and pulled back the bolt just as Samson had done that morning, in order to scare away the bullies who wouldn't stop bothering us. Epp opened the leather jacket covering the Admiral's chest, tore the army issue shirt and striped sailor skivvies underneath. On his chest was a tattoo of an eagle carrying a dragon in its talons. No, I whispered, tie him up. They didn't understand. I motioned upward with my eyes. They'll try to stop us. They understood everything and immediately tied the Admiral's hands and feet with our own ropes. Epp took the Admiral's Mauser, Fair took the rifle, we climbed up the iron ladder, and I knocked on the hatch. They had hardly managed to open it when I aimed the fat barrel of the machine gun at the bandit. He was chewing something and took a step backwards. We climbed up onto the deck. The bandit saw us. Back, I ordered. They began shuffling towards the stern. Most of them were still chewing on something. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed some meat wrapped in paper, bread, and a bottle of moonshine on the bench of the stern. After their work, they had decided to have a bite. Stop, I ordered. They looked at one another cautiously. Their brains had begun working. Take it easy, brother. We can work this out, Black Mustache said hoarsely. What is it you want? Interesting. Did I did I hear Stern? So it sounded to me like the setting was, and I heard military and I heard bandit, right? So it, it sounded to me like the setting was like military almost being assaulted on a ship by, by bandits or something is my loose take on it. So this almost sounds kind of like one of those um, us versus them captive plots is, is, is my initial take from that. Uh, the the writing was so fluid. It was very simple, very easy to follow. It was very enjoyable because it was very easy to follow. I thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of the key things I pulled out is that there's obviously there's three characters here that we know of: Ep, the Admiral, and the Black Mustache guy at the end. I feel like it might be some type of pirate thing or something. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe a submarine, um, because you said they went up the Iron the Ladder. <laughs> yeah, the iron, they yeah. went up the Iron Ladder. Uh, so very descriptive of a submarine or a U-boat. It probably would be a U-boat because he said 1922. So this would be post-World War One, but before World War II. Uh, there's a lot of specific de details in here with the machine gun. Mm -hmm. uh, but he never mentions mutiny or anything either. So 
So there's a lot of well, they, details, but it's still very vague. They like, mentioned machine like gun, like almost kind of like a novelty, like like it, it's almost like new to them. Almost it felt like to me, like like the mm-hmm. machine gun. Like, it wasn't like yeah. hey, ba- hey, pass the MG over here. They're like that <laughs> machine gun. <laughs> that was like I noticed. I thought it was interesting. I don't know if this is just the author himself, but the pistol is named. It's a specific pistol. It's a Mauser. You have a Mauser, but it's the machine gun. Which, if this is 1922, that's still really recent technology. I don't, you don't get proper even beyond submachine guns until like the 19, late 1930s, early 1940s. So, th- this is to your point about it being new and exciting. This is interesting. Um, I, I guess I'm trying to follow same, same as both of you, trying to like place this time if it's in our world, etc. And it, it, there's similar technologies to that period with the obviously the machine gun. So I'm kind of like trying to think through where could this be. That's what I'm really following here. Where, where could it be? Uh, you know, that they're on a ship and they're being attacked by bandits. And it definitely, it, it, it feels outside, like we all agree it's outsider bandits, right? We don't think it's a mutiny because it yeah. sounded to me like mm-hmm. the Admiral was, you know, his rank was still being re- respected. There wasn't a question mm-hmm. of like, well, are you still in charge here? So it definitely mm-hmm. sounds like outside force, inside survival type of a, mm-hmm. a story. Yes. Well, they said tied with ropes though. So why is the Admiral, I think, is tied up with ropes? I was a little confused on that. So either there's a mutiny from the part of the character or there are three parties, maybe. The character on the ship, um, he was tied up the Admiral, and then separately there are also bandits on this ship. Because it doesn't sound like they're supposed to... It sounds like they've been there for a while, but being described as bandits indicates that they're not supposed to be there, at least to me. Yeah. Man, Matt is stone cold face. Yeah, he's got the good <laughs> poker face right like, now. He doesn't smile. His eyebrows. <laughs> he's giving me nothing. nothing. No ear waggle. Nothing. No. He's like, I thought you were frozen. Yeah. Like, Matt, Matt, you there? Wait, pa- pause it and go, and go. Does he have another video online? Can we see if there's a book missing from his bookshelf? Let's. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wow. That's no, this was a this is a deep cut for me. So I'm, I'm glad that you two hadn't read this already. I had to search your channel to make sure. <laughs> very cool. Very cool. All right. Should we move on to crypto selection? Let's. Sure. So I'm going to try to read this. Take as many phonetic. retakes as you can. Yeah. Yeah. As phonetically as possible. Okay. Phonetic. Uh, Uh-oh. Well, or not phonetically, Uh-oh. I guess. Oh, did Uh-oh. you just, did you just not realize you were going to have to read this? <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to try to do the accents because I think that it's the only way that you can kind of understand okay. it. Okay. All right. Okay. I, I okay. Think. So accent forgivable is, is, is being granted, right? <laughs> the yeah. accent safe zone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Let me get a drink. Okay. Hold on. Me, 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 me. <laughs> so I didn't bother him no more about programming nothing. I said, how you doing to kind of getting what you wanted to get on to do today? All you had to sit down and put at, and you know, you just want to put together or what? He said, why did you do some possum? I said, what's powassum? He said, it ain't just powassum. It's all the way some powassum. You never seen a snet of snakes? I said, yes. He said, I never but one of the heavies told me that they do the some pulling and then they get all the tangle and sliding and squirming and writhering together, which is how we do it all the rubbing up to one and nothing skin to skin and talking dancing theory. What's he telling and trancing? That's what when the singing and shouting come, and there's so many cools of Adam, and the party's cools of stone, and the strong and the weak and the interacting, and what happened in the cloud chamber. I said, isn't that where the seed of the red and the seed of the black come into it? He said, yes. How'd you know that? I said, well, when you have been having your fit, and you've been talking then it theory, it could, and do it then, and then you could do it, and now maybe you've done it, even need to get them, maybe, be, get them, nas. Awesome. He said, now when I take it in a fit or what I'm going to say now that they don't mean nothing, that it's just that outers of it. It never comes in the whole thing, really, with all of us gathering. Whereas it just this scattered pieces or broken pot and piece them with a whole water without nothing. And they get nexty and glute firmin in the shape of holding you don't see. I can't make shapes of holding some on on summon. I said, what is you fitting to get if something is coming to you? And now you got to get out on yourself. He said, it's mostly on myself and I listening like I do. That's when I bring out something fit in times. I will listen and something is too strong and the vibrations and it's moving in on my empty space and I have to struggle back to my contextation. I don't know for certain what it put in my mind than it been words, contextation, but of him talking that scattered pieces 
but it's something come to me. We were like two Essen boys. We were going to have to go to it different ways of some time. I didn't know whether or not how nor what built for me. And it would come wielding inside me. It was dark beside me. And listener began to cry. I said, what are you crying about? He said, I was crying for what been I crying for what's going to be. I said, what's the use of that? He said, what's the use of not? I said, maybe it not be have been. He didn't say nothing if he just let my words little off and dwiddle stupid in the air. The black dog bumped against my leg like he was showing me at least his parts of the dark for friendly. I said, I wonder what we're going to do to them two boys of Yusas, listener sung. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, that you, was a great performance. Yeah. Yeah, yeah thank you. Very good. That, and I was like... Yeah, you, you you definitely had the uh, is, well. We haven't heard Cameron's yet, but you definitely had like the most uh, aggressive text so far. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> My but, text isn't aggressive, so I think you'll win the award. <laughs> so oh, I didn't know there are awards. <laughs> so so going out on a limb here by not 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 being too out on a limb. This sounds like Southern American literature to me. I can't imagine anything being translated to that. Maybe I'm way off on that, but. Mm-hmm. Um, you have the, the, you have like the really informal register, you know, with like the, the, the dialect there. But then at the end, I noticed you had more of a formal, you know, narration register being used, which is, but it's also very, he said, he said, like the dialogue tags very clearly at least use pronouns. There's a couple of like, it sounded like one of the per characters names was listener, but, um, it doesn't, if it's Faulkner, I'm telling you, it's, it's like early Faulkner that I'm not familiar with because he, w- that was too clear, but I also know that his earlier stuff was clearer, but it definitely sounds kind of like that Southern, um, the way people argue in, in a lot of that literature is they present like the outcomes as bad, like which, like you're trying to one up, like which one's worse. This is bad. This is how it's really bad. No, if you do it this way, this is bad. And that's just like, kind of like one of those characteristics of like just Southern Gothic writing i feel like and i got that vibe from this yeah i was kind of on a similar wavelength where i was trying to i was trying to piece through the authors in my memory who are comfortable writing like that because there's not a whole not a whole bunch who will actually you know like reflect the uh, like the phonetics of how people talk in their writing Mm -hmm. and i thought it was really interesting how like initially i got kind of um oh gosh i forget his name the author of huckleberry finn mark twain mark twain yeah mark twain uh, kind of vibes in the beginning as he's talking through what sounds like labor, but as as you pointed out, Una, it begins to be it, it becomes kind of uh, an argument how he's using a very informal register in order to present uh, in concrete terms very abstract ideas, which I thought was really interesting, and it kind of took it from kind of that like Twain style novel into something a bit more experimental. That kind of reminded me of um, some less traditional literature, which I thought was very interesting. I think it is cool to see how dialects are transcribed into English. It's not something that we get a lot of in Russian because Russian has like, you know, different it's like levels of formality, which English does too, but it, there's definitely nothing close to like a sort of peasant di- dialect in Russian or this so, something different. And so that's part of the reason why I was just I was captivated watching crypto read because mm. i was like oh, this is really cool um so this was a great selection i did i'll admit yeah. i did uh i did peek at this really quick and i was like oh i can't, I can't wait to try and <laughs> dissect this one and i'm still you know kind of stumped interesting i practiced it- a couple times it was a struggle <laughs> and i i will give that basically the entire book is like that it's mm-hmm. a very tough read and i read it a long time ago um, when I was big into a certain genre when I was younger. Mm-hmm. So, right. um, and it's actually kind of obscure, but a famous in specific genres. And I, okay. you might be like, oh, I've heard of that. Okay. So, I mean, it's it, not like, okay. you know, some of the big, mm. big, you know, famous books today, but right. it's famous in certain circles. Okay. I'm really, I'm really curious because it kind of gives me Finnegan Wake's, Finnegan's Wake vibes. So a little bit mm. too coherent for that, but. Kind of that's what I was like in the back of my mind. I was like, this sounds American, but this really kind of gives me Finnegan's Wake vibes. Yeah, all the words of the first page of Finnegan's Wake entered my brain, but I don't, I don't know what happened. Like, I was yeah. like I have no idea what I just read. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So the last thing I would say too is that's one of those texts where like students will be like, it's too hard to read, right? And and like they hit the eject button very quick. And what's interesting is like we just recently did um, their eyes were watching God by Zora Neale Hurston, which I don't know if you guys have read that, but it's it's a lot of phonetic writing, Floridian uh, dialect. And uh, there's a very famous actor Ruby D who performed it that for free, so you can go down to the audiobook. And when you read it. You know, me being, you know, Yankee from the North, it's kind of difficult <laughs> at times, but then it's just effortless, you know, for mm-hmm. someone that's from the, from that area and having someone being able to read that dialect to you, even crypto's dialect here, it's just kind of like, it's, it's very poetic, you know, it's very representative. I feel like sometimes of, uh, something that can be lost to time, which is nice mm-hmm. to, to kind of capture at times. Right. Hmm. All right, Cameron, well, you want to do, you, you ready to swing, okay. buddy? Yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready. Ever, a large group of bald heads passed by at once. C, C, B, A, B, C, A, A, C, C, B, B, B. At one point, an elegant-looking old gentleman, who himself possessed a full head of snow-white hair, stopped to watch us in action. Pardon me, he said after a while, but might I ask what you two are doing? Survey, I said. What kind of survey, he asked. Social studies, I said. C, A, C, A, B, C, said May Kasahara. The old gentleman seemed less than convinced, but he went on watching until he gave up and wandered off somewhere. When the Mitsukoshi clock across the street signaled four o'clock, we ended our survey and went back to the Dairy Queen for a cup of coffee. It had not been strenuous work, but I found my back and shoulders strangely stiff. Maybe it was from the covert nature of the job, a guilty feeling I had about counting bald men in secret. All the time we were on the subway heading back to company headquarters in Shimbashi, I found myself automatically assigning each bald head I saw to a category A, B, or C, which almost made me queasy. I tried to stop myself, but by then a kind of momentum had set in. We handed in our survey forms and received our pay. Rather good pay for the amount of time and effort involved. I signed a receipt and put the money in my pocket. May Kasahara and I rode the subway to Shinjuku, and from there took the Odaku line home. The afternoon rush was starting. This was my first ride on a crowded train in some time, but it hardly filled me with nostalgia. Pretty good job, don't you think? Said Mei Kasahara, standing next to me on the train. It's easy. Pay's not bad. Pretty good, I said, sucking on a lemon drop. Go with me next time? We can do it once a week. Why not? I said. You know, Mr. Blank, Mei Kasahara said after a short silence, as if a thought had suddenly come to her. I bet the reason people are afraid of going bald is because it makes them think of the end of life. I mean, when your hair starts to thin, it must feel as if your life's being worn away as if you've taken a giant step in the direction of death, the last big consumption. I thought about it for a while. Well, that's one way to look at it, I'm sure, I said. You know, Mr. Blank, I sometimes wonder what it must feel like to die little by little over a long period of time. What do you think? Hmm. That that was fun. That was funny. <laughs> that was great. That was an award for funny, that one. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely one I would read. I, I almost It almost sounds like kind of familiar, like with the categorizing. Mm. I, don't, I can't think of anything that's categorized the bald head, but even the uh, the lemon drop. Wasn't that like in Portrait of the Artist too, where like they focused on the lemon drop, I think it was, for a strange amount of time? Or maybe I'm thinking of, of a different book, but it, it almost sounded like kind of like maybe – Either just they were doing the same thing, or maybe it was even a reference to that. I think. Well, it, it said Dairy Queen, and so you yeah, know like when did Dairy Queen get invented? I think in like the nineteen sixties. So you know it's a modern author. Mm. Well, he, that that throws it off right there. Because I was thinking, man, this is like Pushkin or something funny. <laughs> uh, well, well, we had all these Japanese names in Japanese locations, right? And then you had yeah. Dairy Queen, which you know, obviously it's more modern, right? Because they didn't start bringing in other cultures until much later <laughs> right but even now like it's a it's a tradition if you didn't know to uh, have kfc on christmas like that's <laughs> that's christmas dinner we have kfc like <laughs> <laughs> which i thought was kind of interesting i don't know matt what'd you think yeah weird just clash <laughs> um, well first of all obviously it's pretty funny um but then the the clash of the japanese city names with <laughs> Dairy Queen. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. The I I don't know. I I enjoyed this. I would similar to uh, whoever said they would read this. I would I would also read this. <laughs> yeah, and they're count. They're, the point of the story is counting. At least in this point in the story, is counting mm-hmm. bald men and categorizing. Categorizing. Categories. Yeah. And well, obviously, what... I could picture that there was this guy sitting there, right? 
and he's watching bald men walk by <laughs> and he's like he's an a he's an a he's a b there's a c there's a b b c a a b c c b and i'm just like oh yeah. my god this is hilarious <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And all leading to like that quote that that kind of came in like the almost like the periodic point of by the way we're getting older people right like <laughs> yeah is, is, what is, does it feel like yeah i'd like the it, it's clear that this this person narrating i think is is older having at least a job but then the very the last line seems like something a, a child would ask in the sort of there's no filter. Like, how did it feel to die little by little over time? <laughs> <laughs> it kind of went dark there. It's like, oh, yeah. funny, bro, dark. Well, yeah, it, it, it definitely dark. showed skill on the author's side because it started off so monologic with this is what's going through my head. And it's it's all about focusing on those like little minute details. That it's just like, why are we focusing on that? And it's because he's trying to call out like that aging element. And then even to weave in later on some very quick dialogue that was very engaging too shows that they have like the dialogic you know narrative narr- narration mm-hmm. down too, which I thought was really cool. I feel like that Cameron knows us well, and he might be messing with this. <laughs> this could be King. I mean, he could write. I think this kind of funny weirdness. Where he'd yeah. take a, a Japanese setting, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is I, definitely not in Maine, but <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I will say I had to choose this carefully. I was looking through it, like, given your preferences, I was, like, very on edge of whether this would be something that you would know. No. Okay. It's funny, though. It was definitely the funny. Yeah, yeah no, no. <laughs> I, that, that was probably the one. Like, if, if you, this isn't, like, a tag where you're like, hey, what's mm-hmm. the one that we pick to read? But mm-hmm. it's to kind of look like, oh, like, I never knew that author wrote that way or, Hey, that's something I might be interested in. Like that's mm-hmm. the one that w- I would probably be most interested in just because it's so engaging. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So. Agreed. <laughs> yeah. I want to see what happens on page 113. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. All right. Should we go through our answers now? All right. Let's do it. I'm excited. All right. So my selection and I had a backup just in case it actually was Yukio Mishma for whoever, <laughs> whoever backed that up. The backup was Yukio <laughs> Mishma. Oh yeah. Okay. So I, 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 I picked uh, silence by, by, by Endo. Okay. So I don't know if you guys heard about this one, but it was this is like the movie cover or whatever because they made it into a movie yeah. Martin Scorsese directed it or whatever. Uh, but it's it's kind of a it's based on truish events, inspired by truish events with Christian missionaries trying to uh, spread the the Christian religion into Japan, which was very closed and and even burned the missionaries. To, it was brutal. It was it was not a, a pretty thing. So these people were laying their lives on the line for the sole purpose of believing that these people needed to be saved is kind of the theme of it. Hmm. Interesting. So we're close, but not really. Yeah. Yeah. You're <laughs> close. No, absolutely. All right, Matt, what's yours? Uh, no one really came close with this and that's fair. <laughs> I, there's, there's nothing in the book that would indicate what it is. This is the, the ice trilogy by Vladimir Sorokin. Oh. Uh, he's a, a modern Russian author. This is a really neat series. I'll give just a, brief synopsis it's like almost like a weird sci-fi sort of deal where they find this like magic ice that they just like beat the crap out of each other's chests with and it like awakens something in them and they become like these chosen people well crap now i want to read that (laughs) 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 was that uh what's what's the author's last name uh sorokin s-o-r-o-k-i-n that looks like it was one of those nyrb publications it is good eye yes Um, yeah, and the, the part that I chose was actually a, a flashback in time to the, like, origins of the group that becomes, uh, the, the, like, ice people when it started in the Soviet Union, and it becomes, like, it's, it's really weird, it's really hard to describe what it is in a couple words, but... Sounds so it's fun. an alternate Earth, basically? Like, where this yeah. magic ice is discovered? Yeah, more or less, oh, okay. yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. It yeah, has cool. to be very wild because I've only read one Sorokin book, uh, Day of the Preachnik, but that was just there was more kneecapping and LSD in that book than I've ever read <laughs> everywhere else combined. Um, so, <laughs> it's, it's so if it wild. was just kneecapping, that's OK. If it was yeah. just LSD, but all that together. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that, that was like all in like five pages. That's not like to their enemies. That's just like for friends, just like to for fun. They get together and drop LSD and kneecap each other. Oh, God. So. <laughs> As you do. As you do. What, what when is that from, Matt? When was that written? Uh, that's a great question. I'm the publication guy, so I always like <laughs> to know when it's from. Uh, I think it's from the 2000s, right? Yeah, it looks like the first publication was 2007. Okay, so relatively or, new. 
Okay. The translation was 2007. So new new sci-fi yeah. fantasy. Cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very cool. All right, Crypto, what okay. was your selection? Crypto. I'm so curious. Uh, so mine is Ridley Walker by Russell uh-huh. Hoban. And uh, it came out in 1980. Hmm. And uh, basically it's a um, apocalyptic, post-apocalypse story huh. where there's this young boy that is becoming becoming a man and his name is uh ridley james he goes by james his surname and it's two thousand years in the future after the apocalypse <clears throat> set somewhere in the world by the dialogue it it's, uh, feels like it's you know uh southern america esque um but basically he has discovered a blueprint for um nuclear weapons and he is deciding what he's going to do with this information of destroying it or becoming all powerful in the world. And it follows his journey through this. Uh, men, won many awards back in the day uh, hmm. and is the direct inspiration um, for several, you know, post apocalyptic movies like Mad Max and stuff. Hmm. Interesting. Huh, that's really yeah. cool. That's really, really cool. I'm really interested that a, in that. That was a good pick. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I read read it back when I was big, big mm. into fantasy and sci fi in in high school, mm. and uh, yeah, it, it, it's a pretty fun book. It, it's a pretty fun book. It's a hard read because the entire book is done, you know, in that style. So mm. it, it eventually, though, the words become very natural as you get mm. you know into it. But starting on page one twelve, it's only like two hundred pages or something. So mm. we were over halfway into the book on that protection, uh, that part where James is talking to listener. Oh, good. So I have, you know, personal sacrifice, burning people alive, and you guys have this magical ice and post-apocalyptic <laughs> fun. Okay, okay. I, uh... <laughs> yeah. I'm that guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Cameron. Fair, if Matt had chosen, chosen one one book over from the same author, you would have you would have gone to, like, the most graphic book I've ever read. So, um <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I so I didn't realize this was in the shot until after we started recording. I didn't know if anyone was going to see that. But uh, oh, was that Murakami? Yeah, this was. We read <laughs> uh, the Wind Up Bird Chronicle by Haruki Murakami. I I had to edit out because May Kasahara calls the narrator Mister Wind Up Bird, and I thought I thought Una that might have given it away to you. Uh, I was like checking because I, I remember we we've I thought you'd mentioned to me Murakami, but I couldn't remember if you'd said you'd read a lot or you wanted to read more. I've so. never read any. Actually. Oh, really? That's that's a huge wow. that's a huge which is always yeah exactly like everyone's just like wow you're really in Japanese literature and you've never read Murakami <laughs> yep I know you're a terrible person I know <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry for outing you in the video <laughs> oh no 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 that's public oh he's though. gonna edit this all out don't oh, worry yeah. <laughs> uh yes yeah, so this is it's been a long time since I've read it but um. Basically, at this point, the the main character who is in his like mid twenties, his wife has gone missing, and this is he goes between searching for her in a hotel and kind of like encountering her brother in dreams, and also just hanging out with this sixteen year old Mei Sahara as they do various jobs and talk about life and death, as it is in this this case. But yeah, you know, I think that's pretty typical Murakami, where you just have scenes of levity, very fo- followed very suddenly by. So let's talk about death. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> but funny, like the, the yeah. it came off as very comedic. Yeah. To, be able to talk about such a dark subject, uh, you know, as Matt pointed out, it was like funny, 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 funny death. <laughs> yeah. So no, that that's uh, yeah. Great job to everybody. All good authors. So yeah, these are all yeah. really interesting. Yeah, this is fun. I would say um, w- we were interested in doing more Murakami, so I've been doing some like research on him. Mm-hmm. We were looking at doing Kafka on the Shore potentially mm-hmm. this year, and maybe another one next year. Have, have you read that one by chance? That's actually, I, I know I should have read that because that's like the one everyone recommends, but that's one of the ones I haven't read actually. Okay, oh, collab. Yeah. There. Yeah, oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to read Kafka on the Shore. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're doing that later this year. We'll we'll send you guys a schedule if you're interested. Up to you guys. Yeah. So, so. Very yeah, cool. Yeah, I would love. So oh, yeah. So, all right, guys, thank you for making it this far in the video. We hope you guys had as much fun as we did. Tipsy Tolstoy, link in the description below. You guys have got to check them out. They are hysterical. Uh, Great, great guys. Really appreciate you guys coming on. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah. Peace. Bye, guys.